Hello. Hello, 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 my friends. It's Jill Osborne from the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, February 13th. And even though here in, here in the United States, it's a big, almost holiday weekend with the Super Bowl, uh, that's actually going to start in uh, three hours. And so we got some time to do a support group meeting. So I thought I'd drop in and let's just see how people are doing, how you like, how'd you sleep last night? How was sleep? I mean, I got up. See, I went to bed actually early for me. I went to bed about 1245 and I think I got up at three and then I got up at, then I got up at, at nine. And so I was only up once at, last night. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that as a success. <laughs> now, let me just introduce myself. I'm the National IC Support Group Leader. I'm the founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. I'm the longest serving IC Support Group Leader in the United States at 29 years and counting. Turns out the German ICA and the IC Network, we got started basically right around the same time. So we are, we are all still operating today. Uh, I bring to you several college degrees, degrees in chemistry, drug development, pharmacology, master's degree in psychology, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, served on the U.S. Army Research Panel for about 10 years, so I've had an opportunity to allocate millions of dollars in IC research. Um, so I kind of walk a very interesting line. I mean, yes, I'm a patient. There's no doubt about that. But I am also uh, a researcher. We do, I do, we do a lot of research through the IC network and uh, a writer and all that sort of stuff. Now, I, again, it's a big day today. I really don't know if people are going to come to this meeting today. There is no sweat, no stress at all. I want everybody to have a good, wonderful Sunday. Hello, Sylvian. So nice to see you, my dear. I hope that you're doing well. I really, really, really hope you're doing well. Now, of course, there are two issues that are that are happening right now. Number one, we have a big day. We have a big day, big party day here in the United States. And for those of us who have had bladder issues, kind of the last thing you want to do is go somewhere where you're having to get up and down and go to the bathroom in front of a bunch of people, right? <laughs> you know, it's a little bit embarrassing. Odds are you, you're with COVID, especially, you're probably hanging out at home, and that's a good thing. Um uh, you know, no pressure. It's very, very important that you not stress yourself and pressure yourself to meet other people's expectations here. The reality is, is that if you're under stress, your pain is going to be intensified. And the other great blessing here is that the great majority of us are older and we don't have to prove anything to anybody else. And there comes a, a, a sense of peace when you can finally say, no, I, I, I really can't do that today. Um, the other great challenge with a day like today is food, because if you do go hang out with family, there's going to be potentially nachos and salsa and you name it, it's going to be there. You got to stick to the IC diet. There's not the time to chow down on spicy salsa, not the, chow, not the time to drink a lot of beer without potentially triggering your bladder if you have IC subtype one or subtype two, hunter's lesions or bladder well driven, right? So stick to the Stick to the chips, stick to the stick to the guacamole. That should be fine. Hi, John. Hi, Chris. Chris ordered the CBD cell. Awesome. Give it a shot. See what you think. See what you think. Um, and uh, remember, if you're looking at beers, we did a fairly large research study about what alcohol uh, patients with interstitial cystitis could tolerate. And we did better with pale ales rather than dark brown porters. I happen to love Guinness myself, but I, I'm really... I don't know if I'm going to drink any alcohol this year. I've kind of decided I want to back off. I don't drink a lot anyway, maybe a hard cider every now and then. But, you know, I just like, I just feel like I have to really work on my health and I want to try to lose the weight that I gained last year and all that sort of stuff. D on YouTube says, hello, D. Nice to see you. Got, you were diagnosed three weeks ago. So, D, how long have you had symptoms? Is this new? Did it just start in the last year? Or have you had symptoms for the last 5 or 10, 15 years? Uh, hey, Donna. Donna says his, her youngest son came to... Girl, come on. You got to hang out with your son. Although, granted, if, you're, if your husband and your son are going to hang out and watch Super Bowl, you know, that's, you know, put your, put your son. You got to put your son first. But thank you for saying hi. 
Hello, Marinda. Melissa says, I miss coffee. Any suggestions? Yes, yes, absolutely. So you have to remember that um, uh, the reason why coffee is challenging for us is, is number one, caffeine sti stimulates the nerves that make you pee. <laughs> so if you drink caffeine, the odds are you're going to be peeing more or urinating more. Are we going to be super academic today or super casual today? Let's say if I'm going to be ac academic, I'm going to say caffeine is going to make you urinate more through its neurostimulatory effect. <laughs> if we're just going to be real on a Sunday, hey, you, caffeine is just going to make you pee more. Um, and so we definitely always have to do decaf rather than regular calf. Um, but the other, the other harsh reality is that coffee can be very, very acidic. And I mean, if you had an open wound on your hand, would you pour coffee on it? And the answer is no, you really wouldn't. Your job is to create an environment that will allow your bladder to heal. D, I just want you to know that we really don't think of interstitial cystitis as an incurable bladder disease anymore. We think of this as a pelvic pain syndrome. Why? Because structures outside of the bladder are often involved in driving these symptoms. But it can be a bladder issue. It can be a pelvic floor issue. It can be lots of other issues. So D says here, I had a UTI about six years ago. I didn't have a urinalysis. It cleared up in two days. This experience has been going on for a month now. So D, have you had a culture? Have they, ha or have you at least done a dipstick to see if your urine does have any pathogenic bacteria? Uh, that would be number one. But really, D, the thing that we really have to look for, because you and I, I'm 61, you're 63. The thing we have to look for is something called the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. A lot of patients are really surprised that let's just say they have absolutely no history of bladder issues until one day in their 50s or 60s. Bam, it begins and they're up all night peeing and they feel like they have a UTI, but their cultures keep coming back negative. Why? Because for for women who have uh, are post hysterectomy or they're on chemical menopause or you're actually at menopause at post menopausal we're really going to look at skin health because your bladder you know think about your bladder for a moment it's the only organ in the human body designed to hold toxic waste and urine is body waste urine contains ammonia and urea so the bladder is kind of an evolutionary miracle here is it's the one structure in your bladder that can hold toxins but how can it do it safely? Well, the answer is, is that your bladder is like your mouth. It's a hollow organ covered with a really thick coating of mucus. And the purpose of that mucus is to act as a barrier. So your bladder is very wet inside. Your bladder and your urethra and your vulva and your vagina and your mouth are mucus membrane organs. And the purpose of that mucus is to protect tissue. And it makes it hard for bacteria to reach the cells to infect the cell. But unfortunately, that nice, thick, mighty mucus is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, you have lots of mucus. But when you're older, postmenopausal, guess what? You have much less estrogen. Therefore, you have much less mucus. Thus, your bladder's ability to defend itself is now completely compromised. It cannot do it because it does not have the estrogen it needs to create mucus. So something that you might have enjoyed, like, as you say, coffee over the holidays, you know, you could have done that two years ago, four years ago, six years ago, 10 years ago. What, but you're, you kind of hit that point of no return with estrogen now. And so now what happens is that coffee is irritating because your bladder just can't defend itself. Hi, Tamora. So, you know, um, if your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, so is your urethra and so is your bladder. So do you have anybody suggested, has any of your doctors suggested yet using any sort of topical estrogen to work on that? Jessica says, what's the best calcium supplements for us for IC patients just got diagnosed with osteoporosis and osteope osteopenia? Gosh, there's a lot of contradictory information about calcium. Um, uh, some people say that you have to take calcium and magnesium. Others, you have to take calcium and K2. 
Um, I am just not the expert on that. I do um, calcium glycerophosphate in the form of pre-leaf. And we have a low acid multivitamin that has calcium in it. Um, that's where I get the good majority of my, my calcium as well as potentially from some dairy products. Um, and then calcium citrate. You know, calcitrate is a major, the brand name is major calcitrate. It's quite popular. I, you just need to do a little bit of research on that. That's not really in my comfort zone with respect to information. Uh, D says, not yet. Should I ask my OBGYN, OBGYN to prescribe some? I think you need to have your OBGYN look at your skin and see how you are. And if you're showing dryness and at your age, you have to be showing dryness. I'd be stunned if you weren't. Using topical estrogen would help tremendously, especially if you have urethral irritation because the urethra is kind of the canary in the coal mine. It's a urethra that really starts to scream first with estrogen atrophy. At least it did for me. All right, hold on a sec. Okay, so getting back to coffee, here's the coffee that I drink now, Dandy Blend. Dandy Blend, I love it. I can drink this all day. This is a, this is a herbal coffee. Um, and unlike the other herbal coffees, which are very, very bitter, this one is not bitter. Uh, it's very... Um, smooth. Um, it makes incredible frappuccinos and it makes incredible lattes. Uh, there's no acid in this at all. So we've been, a lot of IC patients are using Dandy Blend now. You can get it in the IC Network shop. Just going, to, going over to the IC Network website or you can get it on YouTube. But this is the one that I drink now. I mean, listen, you got to understand, I love coffee. I love coffee. Coffee is my comfort. It was my comfort during all the fires last year. I mean, the last couple of years when we were evacuated, waiting to find out if our house burned down, I went to Starbucks and got a Frappuccino. Holding that Frappuccino gave me comfort when I was freaking out. The problem is, is that my, my heart is very sensitive to caffeine and I pushed it. I last year I had, or two years ago, I had coffee every day for about six months, decaf. And Starbucks accidentally gave me a fully caffeinated um, uh, Frappuccino. I threw PVCs for hours. And if you don't know what a PVC is, it's a very, it's a giant strong heart contraction that scares the crap out of you. So I had to drive myself to the emergency room at six in the morning because my heart was going crazy. And the, um, the, uh, the emergency room doctor looked at me and he goes, you may never drink coffee again. Never. Take my word for it. Never. You are too sensitive. I, I don't think they'd seen, you know, whenever you go to the emergency room, they're always kind of like, yeah, really? Well, let's see. When they put the heart monitor on me and they saw my heart, they were shocked. And it was just from the freaking coffee. So anyway, I'm now on this. I'm, I love this. And I'm, a, I'm kind of addicted to it too. I love the smell of coffee. I get to smell it, walk into Starbucks and smell it. But you know, this, this works perfectly. I'm just saying, give it a shot. Donna says she loves Dandy Blend. You guys, I'm simulcasting now. If I'm looking straight ahead here, I'm looking at Facebook. If I'm looking over here, I'm looking at YouTube and looking at all your comments here. Uh, we also, Melissa, we do have some low acid coffees over on our website too. Um, so uh, the low acid brews that we think, I think are really the best are going to be Simpatico low acid coffee, um, uh, Tyler's no acid coffee, or my personal favorite is, um, here, hold on, let me grab it real quick. I'm really casual today, you guys. You just got to know it's like 80 degrees here. So from the waist up, I'm professional. Whoops. From the waist down, I'm wearing shorts. <laughs> All right. So the the um, so this is a Simpatico coffee. We have sold this for many, many years. Thousands of patients use this quite successfully. Right. And it's a true low acid coffee. Tastes great. A regular and decaf, although again, I think you should do decaf. Whoops. Tyler's 
Tyler's markets themselves as an acid-free coffee. And no, that's no, 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 yeah, 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 no. In the one coffee review that I saw that actually tested the pH, Tyler's was actually slightly acidic at a pH of like 6.2. Uh, but anyway, a lot, quite a few patients use love Tyler's and it comes in K cups as well. Um, but the one that I think is really the best is called Bella Rosa. Bella Rosa. And the reason why is that it has, they use a different um, roasting method that dramatically reduces chlorogenic acid. And it's the chlorogenic acid that irritates the bladder and the other tissues. So we have lots of coffee that you can try right in the IC network shop. Uh, and we also, of course, have pre-leaf. And if we're going to really try to protect your bladder, pre-leaf, my friends, pre-leaf would be viable. Pre-leaf is calcium glycerophosphate. And uh, you take one or two caplets before you have that cup of coffee or eat that pasta or drink that glass of wine. And that can reduce the acid level dramatically, like 95%. So this is worth checking out too, especially if you really miss, you've got to go somewhere and you know some of the food's going to be irritating or, you know, you just, you just need a break. You just need a break. You just want to, for God's sake, have a little bit of spaghetti, right? All righty then. Let's see here. Hi, Callie. Yeah. Yeah. Cal, so Callie's, it, Callie's in, the, uh, in our Facebook meeting right now. Callie's a registered dietitian who works with interstitial cystitis patients, and um, she is awesome. Uh, we featured her in our magazine, and I think she'd be a really good, a really good person for you to reach out to if you have other questions about the diet. Now, Marsha here. Oh, honey, Marsha. Marsha had a breast cancer scare. So she quit estrogen progesterone combination. The urogynecologist told me, uh, told it, well, yeah, urogyne told it to me straight and said the bladder was horrible. Estrogen was the only thing that will help. Said three tiny dollops and go to two full applicators of estrogen twice a week because the hormone link scares the hell out of me, but I'm doing two applicator fulls. He doesn't worry about stroke, heart attack because, um, Okay, so Marsha, Google topical estrogen safety. The research studies are solid. The research studies show that when you use estrogen topically on your skin, uh, that the estrogen does not penetrate into the bloodstream to any great degree where it can raise your risk of breast cancer and other cancers like that. So topical estrogen is considered remarkably safe. E so I think you're kind of worrying unnecessarily on, um, I do, I do. I mean, just look at the research. The research is really comforting. Hi, Tamora. Miranda says, my doctor couldn't find a physiotherapist to help me. You're in South Africa is not big on this. They shy away from this. I asked my doctor to listen to your life to the live stream. Well, honey, I'd be happy to talk to your doctor. I'd be happy to send some resource materials to him if that would be helpful. But I think one of the most important things that you can do, honestly, is educate yourself, perhaps by getting the book Breaking, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain by Dr. Jerome Wise, so that you get to be the educator. In fact, I did a couple of them so that you can then give one to a physical therapist who might be interested in going there. I mean, the odds are the physical therapists down there, quite a few of them have been trained in working with incontinence patients. So in that case, they're taught to strengthen muscles because muscles are so weak, you're leaking. Now for pelvic pain, we're doing exactly the opposite. Our muscles are so tight, we're trying to relax those muscles. But I'm sure that there will be one or two who, if you give them the gift of that book, uh, I think that you might make a friend and help start this movement here. You know, the IC movement has all been started by patients. You have to understand that. So Anthony and Annette Walker started the British, the, the United Kingdom IC support group. I started the IC network. Um, Barbara Flanagan and one of her friends started the original ICA here in California. Jane Mailing started the Netherlands group. Listen. Every IC 
resource has begun with patients. And we have to understand that if our community doesn't know how to treat it, that we've got to step up and help them learn how to treat it. And to go so far as, Miranda, you know what I did? I got, I got to tell you what I did. I actually, my first year as a support group leader, you know, because I'm pretty bold. I'm, I'm willing to think really, really big. So I went to my local hospital that is attached to a medical school and I knew they did grand rounds. And I said, hey, would you consider doing a grand rounds on IC? And they went, yeah, you got to understand that the person who sets up all the all the grand rounds, they're exhausted. They're desperate for speakers. If you walk in with a proposal, the odds are they would say, oh, man, thank you so much. We would love to do that with your help. Right. And so I literally put my little packet of information together walked into the office and said, I would like to propose doing grand rounds on interstitial cystitis and gave her all the information, was super, super prepared. And I said, and I will get you a great speaker who we ended up doing. We ended up bringing a nationally prominent speaker to come out to Sonoma County where I live. And we did not only grand rounds, we did a patient conference too. And uh, so I say, be bold, Miranda, be bold and mighty forces shall come to thy aid. Hi, Mary. Nice to see you. Dee says she loves pre-leaf. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just you can't take pre-leaf like candy, though. It's it. I mean, seriously, it's calcium. If you take too much, you run the risk potentially of throwing some calcium based kidney stones. So just make sure that, you know, you're being modest. You only take it before a meal if that meal is going to be risky. It's not a treatment for your bladder. It's not a treatment for your bladder. More is not better. Hi, Eddie. Oh, Eddie, thank you so much for the 100 stars. Hi, Rika. Debbie says, exactly. I have SVT and caffeine would put my heart into arrhythmia. It sucks. To I know, Debbie, right? Like I literally have my medication I have to take if my heart starts doing that. And it really only does that. There's only two ways that my heart goes crazy. Number one is with caffeine. And number two, if I have a lot of gas in my stomach. I have a lot of gas in my stomach. It pushes the base of my heart. So I have something called cardiac entrapment syndrome. And basically what that means is that from front to back, from front to back, my rib cage is about a half an inch too shallow compared to yours, most likely. It's genetic. My, my father had it too. And so what the way the cardiologist explained it is because there's not a lot of room for my heart to be outwards and for my stomach to go outwards, what happens is it goes upwards. And so if I have a lot of gas in my stomach, it pushes right up into the base of my stomach and triggers PVCs. It's been happening for decades. Melissa says she also has PVCs. Teresa says, how can you stick to the IC foods if you also have to stick with a diverticulitis diet? Well, this is where somebody like Callie, I think, would really be able to help you here. I mean, the IC diet is basically a simple, fresh, healthy diet. It's just saying loose the junk food and the fast food and the foods that are pretty high in acid. It also is, you know, giving it's a bit of a reckoning when it comes to junk food and soda. You really can't do that. You can't do a lot of soda or anything like that when you have an injured bladder. It's going to hurt. Um, so, um over on our website, icnetwork.org, we have all the information on the IC diet and be happy to go through that with you. Dee here on, uh, on um, YouTube says she has PVC episodes too. And you also have AFib. Yeah, isn't it weird? I think I had my first PVCs when I was in my 20s. Yeah. Scary as hell until, until somebody tells you what it is. Mercedes says, are you trying to sell products? You're trying to help people with advice, honey. If you've never watched me before, then um, I understand that question. I am a support group leader. I come here every week, sometimes twice a week and take your questions. There are days and meetings where we never mention any products at all. It's just what you guys ask me. I, you should never, ever listen. It's free. <laughs> The IC Network website, this meeting is free. I'm not charging anybody for it. But if you do find our meetings helpful, it'd be great if you became a member. 
because you know, got like I have to pay my bills too, right? I, I, you know, when I started the IC network in 1993, um, it was a comp it it. I started it free. It's been free for 29 years. And there were people who said, well, she's trying to profit off of patients. And my answer was where? It's free. Like everything's free. Realize that in my support forum, 200,000 patients a month use it. If I were charging them $5 a month, I would bring in, be bringing in a million dollars a month. And my accountant and my retirement fund shows that it's free and I'm an idiot financially for giving it all away, but I do. I do. I know what it's like. I lived on credit cards for five years after, I mean, I lost my job. I lost my health insurance. My parents took me in. I couldn't work. I couldn't sit in a car. My pain was so bad. I know what it's like to be extremely low income and desperate for information. And back then, back in the early 1990s, we had to pay 10 bucks an article from the ICA. That's why when I started the IC network, it's like, no, it's going to be free. We don't want patients who are struggling, who are trying to choose between paying for medication and paying for food to feel like they've got to pay for content too. McKee says, what can I use for a foul smelling urine with negative cultures, both vaginal and urine? I'm slowly getting more and more depressed listening to negative comments. Oh, honey. So, you know, McKee, I, I got to tell you that, you know, um, to kind of know for, for sure if you don't have some sort of infection, specifically fungal infection. So remember about five years ago, the National Institutes of Health released their study, which found that many patients who were flaring had an overgrowth of candida in their urine. You know, when you think yeast infection, you're thinking vagina or you're thinking mouth with thrush. You don't think bladder. But guess what? Candida can absolutely be growing in your bladder and causing tremendous distress. So, so again, five years ago, our own National Institutes of Health were the ones who made that discovery and published that discovery. Now, quite a few people poo-pooed it. It's like, oh, come on, there's no way, right? I mean, I got hate mail for, for sharing that federally funded research. But get, here's what, literally in 10 days at the Society for Eurodynamics and Female Urology meeting, we have a much larger study done by UCLA, Cedar sinai and the University of New York who studied the urine of patients with pain, bladder pain versus patients without pain. And you know what they found? They found candida in the urine. Well, they found candida in both patients, but the pain patients had different candida. The candida found in pain patients was more pathogenic, more virulent, caused much more cell death, and had a lot more fibers to attach to tissue. And so this much larger study now confirms that some of you who have bladder pain could in fact have a fungal infection. And I will be putting that, I will probably next week be putting a blog up on it, but I've talked about that in the last two meetings. So the fact that you have foul smelling urine and negative cultures, you got to realize that a urine culture misses about 90% of the potential bacteria and other things that can be growing in your bladder because a culture is based on a growth medium and that growth medium like agar well, it's food for only a, only some species of bacteria. It's not food for many other species of bacteria or fungus. And so it's not going to grow out bacteria to it, 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 the, the depth and breadth of bacteria. And, you know, the bladder is supposed to have bacteria in it. 
it's uh, it's not a sterile organ, but we have to differentiate between good bacteria and bad bacteria. So, Mickey, that's what I would do. Honestly, I would have a next generation urine test just to dot your I and cross your T and just see if there's anything else there that could be triggering some of that foul smell. And then otherwise, you're going to have to work with your primary care and see if there's, you have any other underlying health conditions, maybe like prediabetes, that might be contributing in some way. Also understand, too, that your urine, can, your urine smell can be based in t on food. I mean, if you eat asparagus, your urine is, is absolutely going to have a very different kind of sour odor to it. I think the same is true with Brussels sprouts and things like that. So it's also possible that it's coming from food. Marcia says, do you know of a good water filter? I know. I know some make water too acidic. I don't, hun. We recommend we I recommend just a simple, plain um, spring water. Ann says, any tips for urgency today? The urgency is being being driven by the alpha afferent nerve in your bladder wall, which means that your bladder wall is being tweaked in some way. So the odds are there's something that has happened. The, in the last 24 to 48 hours, which has irritated your blood, the alpha afferent nerves in your bladder, which are now triggering that urgency. So uh, I would do our uh, bladder wall flare protocol. So the first thing I would do is I'd increase your water intake to try to dilute your urine. The second thing is you could try alkalinizing your urine to try to reduce any residual acids. You could do that with some pre-leaf or taking a couple tums or even a quarter teaspoon of baking soda in a glass of water. You guys, baking soda in a glass of water is kind of old. That's um, it's been a, people have done it for a hundred years, um, it's, but it's in it's kind of in the it's not an old wife's tale, but it's just an old approach and. You have to be very cautious with that because baking soda is sodium bicarbonate and that could dramatically increase your blood pressure. And so if you have blood pressure issues, you are not going to be doing baking soda in a glass of water. You would be better off with a couple Tums or a couple pre-leaf. So, okay, so that's the next step. Alkalinize your urine. Give that a couple of hours. See how you do with that. If, you, if you're still struggling, the next thing you could do is an over-the-counter azo bladder pain relief pill, which is the over-the-counter version of pyridium. And so where is it? Where is it? Here it is. Okay. Azo. So this is the stuff that turns your urine orange and it acts by kind of numbing and calming the nerves in your bladder wall. So that would be the next step. And if after a couple of days, things are not improving, of course, you would probably want to do a dipstick. Let's make sure you don't have UTI. In fact, I do that first. Uh, and then you might have to call your urologist to see if you can get in for a rescue instill a rescue installation to try that would really strongly numb your bladder wall and turn that nerve off and calm everything oh, down. Here, hold on a sec. I hear voices. It's Sunday and she's working her program. Oh, okay. Uh, Melissa says, any supplements that can help build the bladder wall back? Um, the answer the answer is is yes and no. Now, the American Urology Association and their guidelines for interstitial cystitis have a six-step treatment protocol. You start at step one. You do everything in step one before you go to step two. You do everything in step two before you go to step three. Why? Because they don't want you to do things that have significant side effects and potentially even permanent side effects before you do the easy stuff. So um, what, let's see, here, hold on. So let's just do this real quick because I have a feeling somebody's going to say, hey, Jill, look at that. You're trying to profit off a of patient. Not trying to do that. So let's look at the AUA guidelines here for a moment so that you can see context because I'm not the one saying using supplements. They're the ones saying use supplements. 
So the American Urology Association published IC guidelines in 2011. They were revised in 2014. They will probably be released and revised again this year, okay? The reason why they created IC guidelines is because patients were being treated very, very differently in different parts of the country. Some people were given surgery. Other people were told there was no treatment. Other people, you know, it was a mess. So they created standardized guidelines that they wanted urologists across the country to apply. So we had consistent care. Okay. And if you want to see those guidelines, you can just go to auanet.org. I recommend everybody read them. Canada has their own guidelines. Germany has their own guidelines. Uh, Japan has their own guidelines. The American guidelines are here, auanet.org. So six steps of treatment arranged with respect to the risk of adverse events. So in step one, which is the foundation of care, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be increasing our water intake. We're going to be uh, modifying our diet to reduce triggers because for some people, the onset of IC is just finally their body screaming enough with the diet soda, you know, chemical injury happens. Uh, they suggest using, trying the supplements like Preleaf because they've been out for 25 years and we have a lot of success with them as well as published research studies, uh, muscle relaxation and acupuncture. Okay. So of the supplements, no supplement is going to heal the bladder or build the bladder. The only thing that can do that is the bladder. Your job is to create an environment that will help the bladder calm and heal. So if you, for example, are a IC subtype 2 bladder wall driven chemocystitis or estrogen atrophy, you're going to be looking for something that has a coating effect. And those are the supplements that contain chondroitin because we have research that proves that chondroitin is the most successful at restoring the superficial integrity of the bladder wall. So we're talking bladder builder, bladder rest, Cisto Protex, Cisto Renew, et cetera. Those are going to be your dominant choices. Um, if you struggle with pain, then you're going to want also potentially to look for a supplement that contains palmitoethanolamide, also known as PEA, because we had a research study in 2019 that showed that I see patients who use PEA are remarkably uh, successful. The 87% of I see patients who start P Piora, we it's the the name of it here in the United States is Piora. Uh, that by month three, 87% of IC patients had a significant reduction in their pain. And by month six, several were now completely pain-free. And that makes more sense, again, for people with true struggle with pain, and also especially for people with IC sub subtype 5 central sensitization. Now, we also have aloe. And we know that aloe can have a soothing effect, just like aloe on your skin can soothe burns. There are some forms of aloe that can potentially help soothe the urinary tract. Years ago, we had a young boy, because I see affects all, all ages. So we're talking like a four-year-old who, who all he could tell his mom was, my pee-pee hurt, my pee-pee hurt. And it was bad. And he was at the doctor and they were really struggling. He just was in so much pain. And they ended up trying um, George's aloe drink. And it worked. It worked. It took away his ure urethral pain. And so George's aloe is certainly something that we suggest. You've got desert harvest aloe. That's certainly an option. And then we also have aloe path, which, which is a combination of aloe and PEA. The challenge with aloe is that some people are just intolerant to it. It can cause a gut reaction. And so, uh, you know, for many patients, you, you might try it, but it just might not be the right one for you. And that's true with all the supplements. There's no way anybody can say what is going to be the right supplement for you. And for some of you might be so sensitive, you might not be able to tolerate any of the supplements. But they are out there now. They're absolutely out there and they're available. And you can find them on Amazon. You can find them in the ICN shop, et cetera. Um, in fact, um, the low acid vitamin was actually my idea, you know? So 
Anyway, let's go to step two. What are the step two treatment options? Now, this is what I think is going to change dramatically in the 2022 revision. So uh, physical therapy for pelvic floor dysfunction, oral medications like uh, Elmeron, Elevil, Hydroxyzine, bladder installations like rescue instills, and pain care. But here's what we know now is that the oral medications commonly prescribed for IC have significant problems. Elmeron is now associated with pigmentary maculopathy, which is a severe, can, can be a severe retinal disease. And the amitriptylines and the nortriptylines and the imipramines and the hydroxyzines are all anticholinergic medications, which if you take every day for three years, increase your risk of dementia. So I think we're going to see the typical oral medications move to step four. That's, I think, at least step three. Uh, because if you compare the adverse events of Elmeron versus the adverse events of Cystoprotac, you know, ooh, you know, that's a that's an easy choice to make. All right, what's in step three? In step three, they suggest uh, the hydrodistension with cystoscopy done low pressure, short duration, and also the treatment of any Hunter's lesions. But if if as soon as they find Hunter's lesions, they should be treated correctly. Lesions are treated with laser therapy, fulguration or steroid injection or uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy and I think platelet-rich plasma. So if somebody was asking, is there a supplement for Hunter's lesions? The answer really is no. Um, you know, uh, the, the, greatest, the greatest tragedy I've experienced here in my office working with patients are patients who are in agonizing pain. They have been for years, five years, seven years, 10 years, and it's because they have untreated Hunter's lesions. If you have Hunter's lesions, it's important that they get treated correctly. So how are they treated? Hunter's lesions are treated, lesion-specific therapy, fulguration or laser therapy to seal that bigger wound in the bladder wall, steroid injection, which is preferred over the fulguration because it does not cause uh, scar tissue. And this needs to be crossed out. We're no longer recommending Lyris. In fact, let me just do that right now. I haven't had time to redo these slides. Let me put it down hyperbaric oxygen. So what's in step four? Step four is neuromodulation. This is using a, 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 an electric impulse to try to stabilize the nerves and get the nerves to calm down. We have two forms of neuromodulation. We have it, it can be done uh, in the lower back, that's called interstim, or it can be done at the ankle, that's called urgent PC. Um, Interstim has thousands of published adverse events, including patients have died. There are, uh, last time I counted, about 20 fatalities associated with Interstim in the FDA MOD database. This is why patients normally start with the ankle stimulation first, because there are no serious complications with the ankle stim, because it's just an acupuncture needle stuck into your ankle. Uh, I was uh, I run the ran the Northern California support group when both of these were developed and had lots of early inner stem patients as well as ankle stem patients in my support group. Uh, I did it. And let's see if I can show you my tattoo where they put the, let's see. Can you see a little black spot right there? See that little black spot? That's where they put the needle. So it's three fingers up from the ankle bone and basically one finger down. That's the SP6 acupuncture point. Now I do believe, I do believe that, that the ASO broke me out of a year long. I mean, I'm sorry, not the ASO, the, the ankle stim broke me out of a year long flare. I had my first two hours of that pain and after my third appointment. I had my first day without pain after my seventh, seventh appointment. The other intervention is, in fact, Botox, step four treatment option. Botox, you know, they do for, you know, for wrinkles and stuff like that. Well, they can do that in the bladder, too. Uh, it has actually a wide variety of effects around, around the body. Uh, so 
it's viable. The problem with Botox, the reason why it's in step four and it used to be in step five is because if they accidentally hit the nerve that allows you to pee, you won't be able to pee on your own and you will have to self-catheterize. So Botox should never be done according to the FDA on somebody who is incapable of catheterizing themselves. Um, step five is cyclosporin. Cyclosporin. Now, cyclosporin actually is a bit of a, some doctors have called it kind of a miracle drug for some patients. Um, it has um, uh, been remarkable for patients with severe immune dysfunction. I've shared the story of a friend who's here on Facebook. I won't say her name. I've known her for many, many years. Very, very, very severe IC. She's a teacher. She used to self-catheterize rescue installations in the middle of her school day in the school bathroom. I don't know how she did it. I admire her tremendously for her persistence and determination to keep working despite extremely severe symptoms, way worse than mine were. I, can't, I could not have fathomed working the way she was working. Um, and the doctor suggested cyclosporin, and it's been a complete game changer. She's completely off of all of her pain meds. She is completely off of bladder therapies. She no longer has to self count it has completely changed her life. And, and I was listening to one doctor, I think it was Ken Peters, but I might be wrong, so don't quote me on that, who again said it is an absolute game changer for some patients, cyclosporin. But the reason why it's in step five is because it has some pretty significant side effects. Uh, it, it, because it's an immune suppressant, um, it can leave you vulnerable to infection. Uh, the other issue is it can dramatically raise your heart rate, and, I mean, your blood pressure. And so in her case, that's what happened. Her blood pressure went sky high. And they had to back off on the cyclosporin, do some other things. But she's still using the cyclosporin today, and it has completely changed her life for the better. And I've had many patient stories who have found cyclosporin to be helpful. Your urologist will not prescribe cyclosporin. They will send you to another doctor to do it because it must be monitored carefully. And then step six, step six, we do surgery, surgeries. So surgery is only done in patients whose bladders have uh, uh, have gotten stiffened and small. They can't, they cannot stretch to hold urine anymore. So we're talking about a bladder the size of a walnut. They might want to do an augmentation, or they might actually do a cystectomy where they remove your bladder and create from a little piece of colon a new bladder and you know, a new bladder and a stoma and all that sort of stuff. That's actually rarely done, but there are moments when some patients uh, have to do it. I've shared the, another story of another patient, young patient in her teens, severe bladder symptoms. They thought she was being emotional. They thought it was all in her head. Uh, she called me, I think when she was like 23, 24 years old, she was absolutely hysterical. And even I was like, whoa, okay, this was really over the top. Um, but I absolutely believed her because I'd been there. When they opened her up, when they did, they did a laparotomy to just take a look, you know what they found was that her bladder was virtually destroyed. She'd been in a car accident. And she had been leaking urine into her belly for eight or nine years. Heartbreaking absolutely heartbreaking that she suffered as long as she did before somebody believed her to look. And in that case, they absolutely had no choice. They had to remove her bladder. All right. So there are moments when that happens over in the IC network in our support forum message board. Um, uh, we have a forum run by a woman who had her bladder removed and you can read hundreds of stories of patients considering it, what they've done, what they've gone through, et cetera, et cetera. The treatments that are no longer done are going to be long-term antibiotics, BCG or ricinavir toxin, silver nitrate or chlorpactin, high pressure hydrodistension, and long-term steroids. These are specifically not recommended by the American Urology Association. Okay, so again, getting back to the original question, what supplements would you recommend? I always want to put it in context here. You are an anatomical mystery to be solved. Before you can even talk about therapies, we have to understand your freaking body first, 
right? Because not you are you are all not the same. There's tremendous diversity in this patient population. For some of you, IC begins in childhood. For others, IC begins after men menopause. For some of you, IC began after falling and breaking your tailbone, while for others, IC began after having a baby. And depending upon your subtype, um, that is going to help us focus on the right therapies for your specific presentation of IC. The American Urology Association guidelines say if bladder therapies are not working and you're getting worse rather than better, stop what you're doing, take a step back and revisit the diagnosis. Have we missed something like a chronic fungal infection, like a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder, like a Tarlov cyst emerging by L4, L5, like a uh, posterior fornix syndrome where you're uterus has uh, is no longer anchored and it's flipping around and pushing on your bladder. There are a lot of conditions that can mimic IC and or victimize the bladder to drive the symptoms that you associate with IC. And if somebody wants me to go over the subtypes, I can do that too. Uh, somebody's asking about the cancer warning. There was a cancer warning on Cisco Protect that's long gone. It's been gone for almost two years now. The cancer warning came, it was a Proposition 65 warning required by the state of California. You are required to uh, notify customers if any ingredient in it has, a, has been a known carcinogen. So for example, potato chips here in California are labeled with a Prop 65 warning because when potatoes are cooked at high heat, they, uh, they produce, I think it's acrylamide, something like that, which is an unknown carcinogen. In Cisco Protec, it was an ingredient called titanium dioxide, which was not in the supplement itself, it was in the capsule. Titanium dioxide is a white food coloring. It's in lots of stuff, including toothpaste and candy and anything that's white that's food probably has titanium dioxide in it. Now, titanium dioxide, new research has now led to titanium dioxide being banned by the European Union. Um, it, that is slowly starting to happen here in the United States. Uh, because it turns out that titanium, uh, titanium nanoparticles are, uh, can migrate throughout the body, including into the brain, where they cause cells to die. So the research on titanium dioxide is rather alarming. Uh, the company Im uh, uh, immediately removed it. So, and now Sister Protect isn't even owned by Mylan anymore. It's back with the company that originally developed it, Algonaut. And I can promise you, it's not in there anymore. The, the cancer warning is now gone and has been gone for two years. Anne says, what do I think of Urabel? You know, Urabel is viable. It's an option. It's not mentioned in the IC guidelines. It might be helpful in reducing some symptoms, though. Anna says, can you get an OTC product for a candida infection? You can. The problem is a lot of candida today is uh, uh, resistant to the most common over-the-counter medications as well as to diflucan. Paridi says, Elevil is a tricyclic, not an anticholinergic. It has anticholinergic effects on uh, Yvonne says, can you expand on platelets for Hunter's lesions? Not right now. I'd have to pull up the study. Terry says, I was diagnosed in 2004. I'm still trying to find the right doctors. I go to a new one this week. So Terry, when you go to the doctor, the new one for the first time, please don't walk in and say you have interstitial cystitis. That is a mistake. You will fall down the rabbit hole of whatever their, whatever their beliefs are about interstitial cystitis. You've got to walk in and you have to uh, describe your symptoms in depth. Where are they located? Inside your body or outside of the body? If they're inside of your body, where? Is it your rectum, your vagina, your urethra, your bladder? Um, 
What is their quality? Do they sting? Are they sharp? Are they dull? When is it better? When is it worse? How does it feel when you get up in the morning versus how does it feel at the end of the day? If by the end of the day, you feel like you're carrying a bowling ball around in your pelvis, that's probably pelvic congestion syndrome, varicose veins in your pelvis. Um, uh, so your job is to get them to study your body. And the probably the most important part of that appointment is going to be a pelvic floor assessment. Um, because a lot of patients now we realize probably the majority of patients are pelvic floor driven rather than bladder wall driven. I am pelvic floor driven. I see subtype three. Find out here. here, hold on a sec. I'm caring for a 99 year old and a 93 year old. Hold on. Give me, give me a moment. Hold on. How are we doing in here? Are we okay? Well, it can be. Okay. Are, are you okay, Mom? More or less. So your breakfast is on the table. Oh, thank you. Let me put your hair in a ponytail. How are you? I'm good. I'm doing a support group meeting right now. Well, I heard you guys talking. So I want to get you. It's a Super Bowl day. It is, yes. That fast back in the water. Okay. All right, mom, let's get you into the, into the uh, family room. I mean, into the kitchen. Super Bowl doesn't start for, for two more hours. There we go. Okay. 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 Okay.
And, and even though we did a urine cytology test, which absolutely ruled out bladder cancer, well, not absolutely, but extremely effective at ruling out bladder cancer, I insisted on having a laparotomy, which I had in the September of 1993. And I woke up in that recovery room and there was my fabulous gynecologist, Dr. Bennett, hunk of hunks of hunks with tattoos, OBGYN, oh my God. Um, and he goes, Jill, hun, we found nothing. You do not have endometriosis. You do not have fibroid tumors. You do, it's your bladder. And there you go. There you go. It was a chemical burn for me. So the laparotomy, I, I insisted on it. I was obsessing about cancer. And when they told me it wasn't after doing that surgery, that's when I finally could let that go. Ironically now, ironically now, my bladder is perfectly healthy. My bladder has completely healed. You look at my bladder now, it's a baby bladder. It's absolutely fine. Um, and we, ha I had a hysterectomy and they did it. And he showed me pictures and he went, Jill, now we know that any symptoms you have from this point forward are not being driven by your bladder. They're being driven by your nerves and muscles. And we absolutely right. Okay, Callie said, what do I think of people who are born with IC? This is a case with me with no family history. So, so Callie, I have a couple of, I have a couple of thoughts about that. Um, thought number one is, could you have inherited central sensitization? Are you a redhead like I am? Redheads certainly are more sensitive. Uh, we couldn't use bubble bath when I was a kid. Uh, my, that was true with my mother. That was true with my grandmother. So we can be born with far more sensitive nerves that can give us sensitive skin, a sensitive stomach, a sensitive bowel, and a sensitive bladder. So that would be one thing we would be looking at. But the, the second thing that I would be looking at would be um, birth trauma um, and or even birth defects. So I was working with one patient who, again, is a friend who um, suddenly for no reason, I mean, no inexplicable, no obvious reason became totally incontinent, like gusher from her bladder, gusher. And when they went in to surgically try to resolve that issue, what they found is that she had a really significant birth defect down there. So when she was a kid in elementary school, now in my generation, we all did something called the presidential physical fitness test. I'm that old. Okay. So we had to do pull-ups, we had to do push-ups, we had to do sit-ups, and we had to run around the uh, run around the track. And she shared that she had never been able to run without leaking. But she didn't tell anybody. She did not, she did not even tell her mother. Her entire life, she leaked when she ran. So I would be looking at, at potentially anything at all like that. It's ra extremely rare, though. Melissa says, I went for a job interview. In the interview, I was asked if I was under the care of a physician for any medical conditions. And they also wanted to know what meds I was taking. These questions should not have been asked. You're absolutely right. I was intimidated and scared because I have IC and did not want to disclose that. I think that that's actionable. Um, I would, Melissa, I agree with you. They're not entitled to know that information, um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the, if you Google Americans with Disabilities Act, there are ADA centers around the country. They, they work, you know, they're like for three states. So like there's a, there's a Western ADA center, there's a Plains, et cetera. Um, and they have consultants on staff who will talk to you and tell you what the law is and if that's legal or not. I lost my job in 1993 because of IC. I was fired. Everybody out on disability was fired. When I say everybody, it was only two of us, but we were both fired. And I, let me tell you, I, I filed every complaint I could. I because uh, I found that they were doing it to, they had done it to several other uh, employees who had been out on disability. And so I, let me tell you, I fought back. I do want to say though, so I did a 
I did a grievance, which they ignored, refused to see me because they'd fired me. I did a National Labor Relations Board complaint. I did a state disability complaint. I did a federal disability complaint. My state disability complaint was the one that went forward after a two-year investigation. They could not proceed. They gave me the letter saying I could sue. I immediately sued. I found an attorney to represent me uh, pro bono. And uh, we sued for disability discrimination. I was in depositions for five years. My deposition was longer than OJ's. They tried to wear me down. They did not wear me down. But in the end, I think I was stupid. I should have just walked away. They didn't deserve five years of my life. So if you lose a job because of your IC, you know, don't do what I did, in my opinion. I mean, I just, it made me much worse rather than better. The stress, the money, I had to borrow tons of money from my parents. I paid them back. In the end, I got a printer for five years work. I had enough money to buy a laser printer for my IC network office. Not worth it. So Callie says, yes, IBS, anxiety, overall sensitivity does run in my family. Yeah, well, and so it kind of runs in my family too. And so I would be really focusing on the fact that, that, you, that your family has central sensitization. And there's an evolutionary priority for that. Remember, every tribe needed to have somebody with a really good sense of smell who could figure out if the water was good or not. So being sensitive is not a bad thing. Being sensitive is a tremendous gift uh, because we can figure out if food is good or food is bad or water is good or water is bad. We are the ones who um, are the caregiver givers in a way, as, as you saw. And the odds are you're also remarkable, remarkably intuitive towards animals. Um, not everybody's wired to be a trial attorney. Some people are wired to be artists and writers, and, and some people are wired to be more comfortable out in the country rather than in the city. I, Callie, I'd love to talk to you about that. Hey, when we do that um, a live stream, um, we should talk about that. And we can do it in context, right? Uh, Patricia says, hey, I'm on my third day of marshmallow capsules and it began to hurt a lot. My pelvic floor physical therapist tells me that it sometimes happens before it helps. Any advice? Marshmallow root bothers about half of the people who try it. And my suggestion would be that you stop it. Um, I, 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 I can't say that I've had people say that it got better. Um, that's why marshmallow root is not on, is, is not on our safe list. Um, is quite a few patients have flared for marshmallow root. Not a favorite, not a favorite. Marilyn says, you're such a good daughter to your parents. Don't have a choice. I love my folks, I do. But guys, I've never worked as hard as I'm working right now. Never, never. I haven't had a night away in next, by next September in five years. I will not have been, I will have not slept a night away in five years. This girl needs a break. This girl needs to go to a spa somewhere for a couple of days. But with COVID, it's made it hard. Dee says, where can you find the safe list on our website, hun? icnetwork.org. Go to the pull down menu that says diet. And there's a ton of dietary resources. Just go to the diet food list page. The diet food list page. All right. So, hey, uh, so I'm finishing up our winter IC Optimist. In fact, I'll be working on that during the Super Bowl. And I found a couple of things that I thought you would be interested in. So um, a couple of new research studies that I think are incredibly thought provoking. So let me just run through these here real quick. So one of the things that we've struggled with to diagnose I see is the role of hydrodistension. Um, because so you got to remember, I see was first written about in the middle 1800s by somebody in England. Their case study, their case report for I see is perfect. It matches somebody today, although it uses their language. Somebody with frequency urgency pressure pain, right? Um, 
And then in the 19, 1910, 1920, they, somebody invented the cystoscope. And that allowed them to look in the bladder. And that was when they started seeing that some people had very red bladders and some people had apparent wounds in the bladder. So it's Dr. Guy Hunter, his last name was Hunter, who first wrote about Hunter's ulcers. And then the technique for hydrodistension continued to be refined. Uh, uh, Joan, hold that question for a moment. I'll come back to that. Um, so what they started doing was they started flushing the bladder with fluid before they'd look in it, right? Get everything out. And then they started stretching the bladder, filling the bladder, trying, you know, kind of the theory was maybe the bla maybe the bladder's kind of shrunk a little bit. Let's put a lot of water in there, stretch it out. Maybe that'll help. So there have been expanding and evolving techniques in how we do a hydrodistension. So in 1987, uh, the U.S. issued their first diagnostic criteria for IC for research studies. And they said, OK, to be diagnosed with IC, you must have visible Hunter's lesions during a hydrodistension or what they call petechial hemorrhages, little broken blood vessels, which I have pictures of. Hold on here. Where is my other picture? Well, anyway, let's, we can just use this one. So, up oh, here, hold on a sec. Okay, so for example, the, the early 1987 guidelines said, okay, if you had these, you were slam dunk diagnosis of IC. But they also said, if you have petechial hemorrhages, which are basically a little red, broken blood vessels, that you also met the criteria for IC if you had frequency urgency pressure pain. So it was a combination of what are your symptoms and what do they see in your bladder? So then another researcher went, but wait a second, isn't the test itself causing the bladder to bleed? And so we had another doctor who I asked women who were going to have a tubal ligation said, hey, can we do a hydrodistension and look in your bladder? And they got 50, I guess, around 50 patients to agree. And they did that. And you know what they found is for these women with no history of bladder symptoms at all, when they stretch their bladder, it caused petechial hemorrhages. It caused the bladder to, red, to turn red and have little red spots on it, a lot of little red dots on it. So when that study came out, it's like, okay. So the test itself appears to be causing some of the visible bladder damage that they were seeing. And that is why the current diagnostic criteria for IC no longer requires hydrodistension for the, you know, since 2011. Hydrodistension is only done if the diagnosis is in doubt. They're no longer requiring a hydrodistension to look at the bladder, unlike Europe, where they require everybody to have a hydrodistension. In the U.S., we don't. So we have all basically, you know, been under the assumption that the, that the hydrodistension itself was causing the, the vast majority of the bladder wall damage that we were seeing other than Hunter's lesions. Hunter's lesions are absolutely separate and distinct. And again, this is what a hunter's lesion looks like. And the test is not causing this. So we have some research from Asia, I think China, might have been Japan, who found that if you stretch the bladder for even two minutes, it caused more petechial hemorrhages and glomerulation. And so this study, number one, again, kind of confirms that when you stretch the bladder gently, low pressure, short duration, two minutes, you can still cause petechial hemorrhaging. So I thought that's where they were going with this study, right? Until I got to the, the, the conclusion and the conclusion was they were suggesting that um, the hydrodistension would reveal structural changes 
in an icy bladder wall, which may not be visibly detectable. Now, I don't know what to say about that. It was interesting. Oh, uh, we have a research study on a medication called Tadalafil. Um, that appeared to help frequency the most. And there was no difference between Hunter's lesion and non-Hunter's lesion patients, but it did cause tachycardia, speaking of heart issues. Um, hold on, there were a couple of others here. Uh, a, a paper that, again, found that Botox appeared to be pretty safe uh, and effective for some patients. There's a paper on platelet-rich plasma. And, uh, in three prospective clinical trials, patients with ICBPS who underwent monthly intravescal uh, PRP injections, they were found to have a statistically significant improvement in their symptoms, including a modulation of growth factors in inflammatory proteins, so in other words, the inflammation reduced. Um, so that's fairly promising. Uh, another, another paper that's talking about maybe we need to target the trigone for therapy. Paper on the ankle stem I talked about earlier. that nurse stimulation, either PTNS or nystem, appear to be effective in treating refractory idiopathic overactive bladder in terms of frequency, urgency episodes, nighttime voiding, however, did not show any improvement in continence. Um, couple of biome studies. I'm going to have to read about before I can talk a little bit more. Neuromuscular approach, your dynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we got some interesting research that's coming up. Uh, Darlene said, is that the same as, are Hunter's lesions the same as Fisher's? N oh, I, I don't know. Hunter's lesions can appear as cracks and a Fisher's kind of like a crack. But I, I think that a Fisher is more penetrating through tissue all the way like a rectal fissure goes from the outside, inside all the way to the outside, whereas hydro, you know, Hunter's lesions do not do that. All right, I wanna go talk to Joan for a moment. Joan says, I notice a lot of bladder supplements contain cranberry. I thought cranberry is bad, for example, D-mannose. So, you know, the worst place to go for, uh, for anybody struggling with interstitial cystitis and or bladder pain syndrome is in fact a health food store or a vitamin shop. Because as soon as you say bladder, they go right to the cranberry because their assumption is that the bladder is being impacted by some sort of bacterial infection. Um, uh, cranberry, obviously, anything that contains a significant amount of cranberry has the potential of being very acidic and very irritating. We don't have chronic UTI. I mean, a tiny percentage of patients might. Some of you might have chronic fungal infection for sure. Um, but if you have Hunter's lesions or you have estrogen atrophy or you have um, uh, chemocystitis, something like that, cranberry is going to hurt like hell. Cranberry juice is going to be devastating. I know I drank a, a quarter cranberry juice a day that first year from 92 to 93, not having a clue that was hurting my bladder even more. Um, so. But the thing is, a D mannose is not the same as cranberry juice. D mannose is the isolated sugar mannose. So D mannose by itself is not acidic. And the ultimate uh, bladder supplement for recurring UTI is going to be a PAC product, proanthocyanidins, PAC. PACs are another ingredient that comes from cranberry that appear to be the most effective at uh, interfering with the bladder, with the bacteria's ability to penetrate through into a cell and infect a cell. And so if you're struggling with recurring UTI, the odds are your doctor is going to suggest either the over-the-counter supplement Allura, E-L-L-U-R-A, or Prevent, P-R-V-N-T.
All right, somebody's come into our Zoom meeting. Hey, do you want to do Zoom today? Listen, somebody came into the Zoom meeting. We haven't done Zoom for a couple of months. Um, I hate to leave them hanging there. So normally at two o'clock, what we would do is we would shift over to a Zoom meeting so that you could talk to me directly and share your story directly. Um, let me just take a peek and see who that is. We just haven't, we haven't had a lot of demand for it recently. So hold on, let me just open up Zoom here for a moment. I have to open up my big my big binder of passwords here. And of course, I don't have my password for Zoom written down. I'm trying to start it on the wrong computer. Uh, let me see if I can figure it out. I I tend to be fairly predictable with my pattern. Okay, obviously it didn't work. Hold on, I got it started on this computer. Hold on. Okay, I started that there. Let me try this a different way. waiting for the host to start the meeting, but I am the host. <laughs> All right, so let me go to this computer. And I guess I have to host it on this computer. Give me a moment, guys. Sorry, I, I hate to leave somebody hanging, you know. All right, I'm in here. Recording in progress. All right, and I'm going to turn that off. All right, there's nobody in here. Okay. All right, well, if anybody wants to Zoom, you let me know. I've got it up and running. Uh, Except it's going to slow down Facebook, which is going to suck. I don't want to do that. Okay, I'll leave it running on this computer, so we'll see. All right, hold on. No, I don't want to update my computer. Okay, let's minimize this. All right. Jerry says, did you say the pacemaker in the back is not safe? I'm saying that the pacemaker in the back has hundreds, if not thousands of severe adverse events reported in the FDA mod database. So it's very important. Listen, InterStim, the challenge with InterStim. So InterStim was created uh, uh, by Dr. Richard Schmidt and Dr. Tanago at UC San Francisco in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to 
create a way of normalizing nerve function in the pelvis. And so they started attaching a TENS unit to various nerves in the spine. And they felt that they were onto something. So they created leads and they created a device that was implantable. And um, the early research was somewhat promising. Um, uh, there were some flaws with their approach back then. They did not use anesthesia to implant the leads in the back. So patients were incredibly traumatized. And I know this because I was a support group leader and they were in my support group and they were hysterical at times. Uh, one very famous case or one not famous a case that I will never forget was a mother whose teenage son had quote unquote interstitial cystitis the doctor said hey we've got this new procedure we'd like to try we think it could really help mom said okay sends her son in three minutes later she she hears her son screaming for help screaming that's because they did not implant the leads with any anesthesia. So they basically cut them open and put leads down into his sacrum and spine. He was so traumatized, he didn't talk for days. And of course, in hindsight now, we re especially in teenagers, what we're finding is that, especially in young, young men, is that it's usually a muscle injury, a muscle trauma. It has nothing to do with the bladder. The bladder has been victimized by another issue. So the early days of Anderson were very, very rough. Uh, the, the, the leads moved easily. Uh, so Evelyn, my co-leader, had it done and she was good until she sat in her car. And when she sat in her car and bent down, the lead, the lead moved off of the right nerve and her husband ended up, ended up pulling the lead out of her spine. It was ridiculous. Uh, very controversial, very, very, very controversial. Uh, and so another doctor at UCSF saw the early days of interstim, saw the suffering the patients were going through and said, guys, you know, you don't have to do it at the spinal cord. You can do it at the ankle. You don't have to open them up. And he is the guy who created the ankle stimulation known as um, the Stoller Afferent Nerve Stimulator, SANS, or post tibial nerve st stimulation. So we had at UCSF in their urology department, we had the inner stem guy and we had the ankle guy. And the ankle guy was absolutely horrified at the patient experience with the inner stem guy. And so was I. So much so that I called the company and the company sent out reps and we went through it in depth. These patients were forever traumatized by their early inner stem days. Well, anyway, a lot's happened. Medtronic bought the device. They refined the device. They changed the leads, they've made the unit smaller, they've improved their surgical technique, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not the device that it was when it first started. But that said, there are just a massive amount of side effects that continue to be reported in the FDA database. So let's just, I'm just gonna go there right now. So I'm gonna go to, this is the, you can follow along, along with me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Google search for FDA MOD, M-A-U-D-E, like the old TV show, MOD database. It's called the Manufacturer and User Facility Database. Okay, so now I'm on the MOD search page, and I'm going to type in, all I'm going to type in is the brand name Interstim, and I'm going to search from January 1st, 2021 to January 31st, 2022. So let's do that search and let's just see what happens. Okay. So um, 500 adverse event reports filed in the last year about Interstone. 500 in a year. So let's go to the first one. This was reported January 28th. This was a failure to deliver energy battery problem. So the device malfunctioned. All right, let's go to, I don't know what that is. Um, difficult to insert, the material twisted and bent. Uh, okay, let's go to this one. Premature discharge of battery, insufficient inf information. So what that means is that the patient was probably being shocked. I had a patient call us who 
after her inner stem was implanted and then she lost her health insurance and her doctor refused to care for the inner stem, she started getting shocked every time she had a bowel movement. And the doctor told her that was normal. That is absolutely not normal. Uh, and we ended up connecting her back up with the company who ended up connecting her to another doctor. And her, um, I think if I remember, now this was several years ago, I think the lead had migrated into her bowel. I might be, it's a long time ago and I, it's a long time ago, but that's been documented that the lead used to move a lot. Uh, let's see. Here's one filed December 15th, malfunction. Information was received from a manufacturer representative regarding a patient who was implanted with inner stem for a urinary dysfunction and, and pelvic floor, GI and pelvic floor. It was reported that the patient complained about their inner stem turning off and the patient had more incontinence accidents. The patient checked the implant and confirmed that the therapy was off. The rep said the patient went on a forum and got information that SCS interferes with inner stem. I'm not sure what that is. Technical services reviewed the rep that the patient uses a, a handset or communicator connect to the inner stem, a completely different platform to control the therapy to SCS. Therefore, they doubted the SCS was turning it off and on. Um, and the patient had to go back to their regular provider to figure out what the hell's going on. Here's one that mal a malfunction, battery problem, loss of data. Let's just go through. Let's just go through some of these. Um, Information, so this was filed on, this is an injury event. So this patient was harmed. Uh, this is, um, information was received from a patient who was implanted with an implantable neurostimulator for urinary dysfunction. It was reported that the reason for the call was that they had the implant replaced with a device from another company with better longevity. The caller stated that the implant was removed, but when the doctor attempted to remove the lead, it broke and part of the lead remained in the body. That's a problem. That's a real problem. You know, you can't, if you have metal in your body, you cannot have uh, certain diagnostic procedures like MRI because it would heat up the metal and the metal would cook the tissue around there. So inner stem can be very, very difficult to remove. The longer that it's in, the more scar tissue develops around the lead. And so some, some doctors have been forced to just basically cut the lead and leave it in the spine, which then creates long-term problems for that patient. Let's see. Malfunction. malfunction, uh, intermittent con continuity, failure to deliver energy, failure to interrogate, energy output, charging problem, communication, transmission problem. Wow, that's, that's definitely a manufacturing issue. Uh, failure to deliver energy, unintended collision. Boy, it'd be nice to know more about that. So I've gone through... Okay, here's somebody, migration. Oh, here you go. Migration or expulsion of the device, unintended collision, therapy delivered to the incorrect body area, inappropriate, adequate shock or stimulation. Um, and so this patient was getting shocked after her device was implanted. Let's just do one more page here, just out of curiosity. Let's just see what we can find. Okay, here's a patient who was incontinent afterwards. Let's look at this one. Uh, uh, pain, paresthesia. Let's look at this one. Incontinence and pain because the device migrated. Malfunction. 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 Uh, 
Okay, this is an interesting one. Information was received from multiple sources, the manufacturer, the healthcare provider regarding a patient who was implanted for their bladder. It was reported that the patient came to the healthcare provider reporting symptom return. The healthcare provider ran a check, which came back as malfunctioning during the patient's revision surgery to replace the device. It turned out that the lead, that the device was not actually attached to the lead. It had some, it, it broke. All right. So listen, I'm not, I'm not against inner stem. There's a place for inner stem. If you are completely incontinent, bowel or bladder, inner stem could be life-changing for the better. But inner stem requires a lot of research, a lot of thought, and a lot of care. Um, uh, we had a patient in Florida, lost her health insurance. Uh, well, I, I actually shared that story. She was getting shocked by her device. Her doctors refused to see her because she didn't have insurance anymore. She was being hurt several times a day by this device shocking her. And it turned out there was only one doctor in the state of California, I mean, in the state of Florida, who would take Medicaid, Medicaid which I think she was on, to go in and fix the device. So there are a couple of things you got to ask. Number one, you got to ask your doctor what their experience is, uh, what type of side effects they've seen. Have they been able to resolve those side effects? How many surgeries should a patient normally expect if they're going to have inner stem? It's at least two implant explant, but sometimes if the device fails, you've got to go in and revise the device. You might have to change the battery, et cetera, et cetera. But the most important thing you have got to ask is about cost. Inner stem is not a one and done. Inner stem requires many visits to monitor it because things can go wrong badly fast. So um, I was working with one patient, um, a nurse lived in a small town, three urologists in her town. They all told her her only treatment was inner stem. She felt forced to do it but she, she chose to do it, but she, you know, was trying to be very proactive. So she called, she talked to the billing, uh, the billing person in her doctor's office. Is this approved by my insurance? They said, yes, no written pre-authorization is required. She called the hospital billing office at hospital. She was working at, at a nurse. Is this covered? Do I need a written pre-authorization? They said, no, you are absolutely covered. Then she went over the top, called the insurance company and said, I just want to verify, is this covered by my health insurance? She was told, yes, absolutely. No written pre-authorization is required. She had the surgery. A week later, she had a bill for 80 freaking thousand dollars and a threat to garnish her wages. The mistake she made is she didn't get it in writing. You get it in writing. If you're considering interstim, you get it in writing. Then you ask your doctor, if I lose my health insurance, who's going to care for me? Will you care for me if I'm not covered by insurance? And if that doctor says no, I probably would walk, I would walk away from that. So, so from cost to long-term maintenance to published hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of adverse events, InterSTEM is a hard sell for me personally. When, especially when you have an affordable option that does not carry surgical risk, and that is the ankle stimulation. It's now called Urgent PC. Google Urgent PC and go to their website. It is cheaper. Doctors don't make a lot of money off of it. So they might, some doctors who are profit driven, they're going to push Interstem because they're going to make more money off of Interstem. But you got to be informed. So if you don't believe me, Google FDA mod database, put it in there. And I double dog dare you to go through all of last year's adverse events. And if you're really courageous, go back the, through the last 10 years of adverse events. You'd be shocked. We've had some, there was a case of a woman whose heart started beating in time with her inner stem device. It's a very passionate letter. You'll find a lot of deep tissue MRSA infections. Uh, I had one patient, again, who had the procedure done. 
And she knew the trial worked beautifully for her. She agreed to the implant. When she, when she came out of that OR with the surgical implant, she knew immediately that something was different. It didn't feel the same. She told her doctor, she told the rep, there's something wrong. It doesn't feel good. They did not believe her for months. It was getting worse and worse, severe pain, yada, yada, yada. They opened her up and her belly was filled with rusty battery fluid from an inner stem device that had broken and she had gangrene at the site and permanent nerve damage. So that was told to me by her personally. So ankle stem is a lot easier and a lot risky. The only thing about the ankle stem that I think is really important to share with you is that it should never hurt. I mean, basically what they do Again, so so here's here's the ankle spot that they did it at. They will put a, an an acupuncture needle uh, as a vector to the nerve right in that spot. There's a few things they have to do to get it in the right spot. And then what they will do, so they normally do both ankles. They do both ankles, and then they attach a clip to it with a tense unit. And they will slowly turn that TENS unit on. And they're looking for the big toe to bend down or the little toes to flay it, flay out, flail out. So if they turn it on and your toes don't move, it's not positioned correctly. If they turn it on and the big toe bends down or the other toes start to flay, now we know we're, we're in the area of the nerve that's positioned well. And then they will slowly turn it up just a little tiny bit just to try to, uh, actually, no, I, no, I'm going to take that back. They actually back off. They turn it up to get the toe flex, and then they back off. It should never hurt. More is not better. If you turn that electrostimulator up to the point that it's hurting, you are going to kill that nerve or damage that nerve. And so we had a, a nurse early, early on who uh, wanted to do it. And she watched Dr. Stoller's video and I think talked to Dr. Stoller. She talked to me too. The one thing I just said is more is not better. Do not turn it up to the point that it hurts. I said, rule number one, more is not better. What did she do? She turned it up to the point that it hurt and she ended up with that nerve damage in her feet because of it. So you got to be modest here, guys. More is not better. Listen, I see and pelvic pain is not easy to treat. There are many factors which can contribute to this pain. From tight pelvic floor muscles to something wrong with the uterus, something wrong with the tailbone, something wrong with muscles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so don't look for a quick fix. And don't turn it up to get a quick fix. It's not going to happen. I don't know inner stem or ankle stem fixing anything. I don't think it fixes anything other than it might remodulate dysfunctional nerves. So, Jerry, I hope that that answered your question. Lisa, you took your message back, so I couldn't see it. Sorry, hon. Ask again. Mary says D-Manos was recommended to me. Do many people have relief from it? No, honey, no. Okay, so so um, Mary, all D-Manos is going to do is maybe uh, interfere with E. coli affecting your bladder. See, the, but the thing, girl, listen, you, you've had IC since the early 70s. You got to understand that back then, everybody believed that this was an incurable bladder disease. We don't think that anymore. Now we really have a very clear understanding of the role of muscles and nerves and other things that can, that can cause this too. And so somebody who's recommending D-Manos to you is really just operating under the assumption that there's a, a E. coli going on. And the odds are there might not be, although you are now much older. And if you are menopausal, postmenopausal, you are going to be more vulnerable to infection because of the loss of estrogen. And so D-Manos in that context makes sense. Uh, 
Joan said, I had a cystoscopy and they and was told they could tell that I had a lot of UTIs. When I questioned, what does that mean? They could not answer. Does that mean bladder damage? Sometimes it's scar tissue, hun. Sometimes scar tissue. Uh, Angie, I won't forget about you, hun. Don't worry. I'm just trying to plow through the, our magazine. I'm trying to get our magazine to the printer. So that's my priority right now. I will get, uh, we will do that this week for sure. Uh, Michelle says, is Interstim a spinal cord simulator the same thing? Uh, Interstim is a spinal cord simulator made by Medtronic. There are other spinal cord simulators made by other companies. April says, I was diagnosed in 1992. They said streptococcus caused it. Well, I think that was a guess at best. Um, you know, again, when we think about the triggers for IC, for uh, the triggers for pelvic pain or bladder pain, we're really going to be looking, at, we're going to be looking at and trying to, at, trying to figure out if there was any trauma involved. So number one, chemical trauma. Did you go through chemotherapy or were you drinking a lot of green tea or diet soda? That would certainly traumatize the bladder wall and injure the bladder wall over time. Or did you have a baby and suffer any sort of injury from having that child? Or did you have endometriosis or a fibroid tumor? Or did you fall and break your tailbone? Or were you the victim of abuse um, or rape? And for, for children who, whose symptoms begin at a very, very young age, we're often seeing 80% um, of those kids are, are it's usually going to be some sort of major physical injury, but for 20%, it can actually be from abuse and bullying, where that patient is stuck in fight or flight, that brain is stuck and living in constant fight or flight, even 30, 40 years later, which is going to create long-term perpetual tight muscles. April said, I was 18, nothing but a herniated disc. So April, were you a cheerleader? Did you do any sports? I mean, what herniated your disc? Because that's a big giant clue right there. So you were in constant stress. Okay, but but the stress isn't going to herniate your disc. What herniated your disc? Do you have scoliosis? Um, Lisa asked, how often is PTNS done? Once a week for like 10 weeks. Many sports, all. Okay, so um, so do you remember falling on your tailbone? Like, did you, were you doing gymnastics, ice skating, gymnastics? I mean, are, a cheerleader, ice skating, gymnastics, horseback riding, ballet, were you a dancer? And, and what do you think herniated your disc? Was it a fall? Okay, okay, so April, so today we look at you very, very differently. We look at you as a physical injury patient, I see subtype three, pelvic floor driven. So what the research shows and what uh, some excellent, excellent uh, doctors have now explained, and this is, this is really the book you need to get, hon. You need to get this book. This is a phenomenal book, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain by Dr. Jerome Weiss. And he talks very specifically about trauma, recurring trauma. You herniated it, you herniated it, serving a tennis ball. Now, see, I was a tennis player too. Fascinating. Fascinating. So, so um, I call it the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor? The reality is that they're both involved because they're both incredibly interconnected. But um, one is normally driving the other. So for some people, IC begins after a, a, a bladder injury. So let's just say that you, you were drinking a massive amount of diet soda. Okay, so the, the NutraSweet is metabolized into formaldehyde and formic acid, very damaging to the bladder wall. The company admits it, that that a NutraSweet can cause urinary frequency from that. So the, here we have a constant chemical burn, for lack of a better term, in the bladder. The bladder is now breaking down. It is starting to hurt. 
and your muscles are getting tight to protect you from that pain. That's called the guarding reflex. That's subconscious. You can't change that. So our therapeutic priority for that patient is to calm and soothe the bladder. You know, once we calm and soothe the bladder, then we know that the muscles should release and relax. But that's actually the smaller group of patients. In my opinion, the much larger group of patients are patients who be, whose symptoms began with a muscle trauma. And what we know is sometimes it's, a, it's m minor recurring traumas, a fall here, a fall there, bike right here, back right there, et cetera, et cetera. Every time you sustain a fall, like on your tailbone or on your glute, you injure muscle and you, you may end up with latent trigger points, which are, you know, lumps of muscle. And then you kind of get the straw that broke the camel's back. There's one specific event, which basically turned all that pain on. So now we have muscles that are tight and dysfunctional. And um, that patient ends up with what in a, in a condition called ischemia, ischemia, which is basically oxygen deprivation and nutrition deprivation. The muscles are so tight, the blood flow is now dramatically restricted. So the bladder is not getting the blood flow it needs to be healthy. The nerves are not getting the blood flow they need to be healthy. And then one day, now you really, you really, you were a kid. You just really didn't track all these muscle injuries. You just didn't. Um, one day you have frequency urgency. And you call the doctor, hey, I think I have a bladder infection. Back then, hon, what they do? They prescribed you antibiotics over the phone. You took the antibiotics. I took the antibiotics. Didn't go away. You go back to the doctor. You have urine cultures. Most of the urine cultures came back negative. And the doctor's like, I don't know. But then maybe you fall down the yeast, the, the, the yeast uh, hole. And they go, well, maybe you've got candida. And they throw you on lots and lots of monostat. They don't go away. Now, I'm going to bet that by the time you were in college, you probably had vulvodynia. You probably started having some vulvar pain, even maybe some irritable bowel. So you're a good patient. You're, you were a good girl. You wanted to get better. So you did everything they tell you to do, told you to do. You took antibiotics, a lot of antibiotics. You took whatever medication they gave you. You wanted to get better. But the problem is, is you didn't get better. So you go back to the doctor and the doctor goes, well, maybe you've got this rare bladder disease called interstitial cystitis. It's incurable. I'm so sorry to tell you this. Here's some Elmeron, be on your way. But you were in the 70s. They didn't even have Elmeron back then. What they had was silver nitrate. Silver nitrate is the equivalent of burning, chemically burning your bladder lining off. Chlorpactin, kind of the same. Back then, they assumed it was a dysfunction of the bladder wall, so they did bladder strippers. So silver nitrate, chlorpactin stripped off the bladder wall. Didn't help. Your, skin, your symptoms continued. And then in 96, Elmeron was approved. You might have gone on Elmeron. You might have done DMSO. You did everything. Didn't help. You still have IC today. Why? Because back then, they didn't know about the muscle problem. Today, if you're to be diagnosed today, one of the very first things they do at the very first appointment is a pelvic floor assessment. Because now we know to look for tight muscles. And our therapeutic priority for this group, if that patient has tight muscles, just to restore blood supply. How do we restore blood supply? By relaxing the muscles. April says, story of my life. Exactly. Story of my life, too. It's, it's how everything's changed. Back then, I had about 100 urethral dilations because I had frequency urgency. So I didn't have bladder pain until I was 32. But I had frequency urgency in seventh grade. Seventh, eighth, ninth grade, I couldn't sit through class. I did about 100 urethral dilations at the time. Then in high school, I got vulvodynia. Felt like I had a yeast infection all the time. Sometimes they'd look at my vulva and it'd be super red. Other times it'd be normal. And they just said, Jill, you have the most sensitive skin I've, I've ever seen. Okay. Then I started throwing ovarian cysts. Then uh, at my first, call, my first job after college, IBS for the first time. Then migraines a couple years later. Then all these weird food sensitivities later. And then finally at 32, I had... I, I had bladder pain for the first time, which we associated, in fact, with this pool injury. But when I go back in time, 
I truly believe, I truly believe that this all began when I broke my tailbone in seventh grade, but I also developed scoliosis in seventh grade. Zara says, thanks for the advice. When I called last week, you're already feeling better. Yay! That's what we like. That's what we like to hear. So one of the articles, and April says here, yes, I peed myself all the time when you were young. Were you peeing yourself even before you were a teenager? Because that that then implies, again, some, some interesting issue, you know, physiological issues, but you know, either muscle, muscular or ner or, or nervous system. So you're kind of like my my friend. I was telling the story of my friend who could not run. Uh, she every time she tried to run in elementary school, you know, the old presidential physical fitness thing, we had to we had to run a quarter mile. Right. And she did too. She peed herself a lot in grade school too. And what they later found out was that she had a birth defect. I mean, just a couple of years ago, she's now in her 40s. She had a birth defect all that time that I think her I think her perineum was too short, dramatically too short. There was definitely, yeah. Florence says, what about pain management when you've tried everything else? Well, even if you tried everything else, uh, uh, Florence, we're not going to be able to focus on the right pain care for you until we understand what's driving that pain. Now, the American Neurology Association is aggressive. They want pain treated. They don't want you to suffer. Absolutely, they do not want you to suffer. They want pain assessed at every doctor's appointment, and they support the use of opiate medication if necessary. But they also say, listen, we're not just going to cover up the pain. We've got to get to the bottom of the pain. What's driving that pain? Is the pain coming from a hunter's lesion? The, the, the most intense pain, chronic pain that occurs in patients in my experience, are patients with untreated Hunter's lesions. And when you treat the lesion, the pain usually improves, if not goes away, in like 85% of the patients who have them treated. So we don't want you to be on strong pain meds for the rest of your life. Let's, for, let's treat the freaking lesion. If we can treat the lesion, then the odds are you're going to have a much better life, right? So whether it's coming from a Hunter's lesion in your bladder wall or if it's coming from super, super tight muscles or SI dysfunction or a bad hip, or it can also become from, coming from your central nervous system. You know, so um, um, Lisa, I'll come back to that. So one of the things that we see in patients with pain, long-term pain is what we call central sensitization. That, that, um, what's the right way to say it? Um, you know how, I don't know if you've ever had anybody in your family who, when uh, a storm is coming in, they, their knee starts to hurt. Like, oh, my knee's hurting. A storm must be coming in. Okay. Why? Why did that happen? What that means is at some point in time, that nerve was injured. So if you were to break a bone, for example, Lisa, hold that question. The answer is going to be a big no on that. Um, let's just say you, you, you break a leg. So you've broken the bone, you've broken the muscle, and you've traumatized the nerves. Well, we know the bone can heal. We know the muscles can heal. But what about the nerves? An injured nerve becomes a sensitive nerve. It means it's easier to turn on. And that sensitivity can start in the knee. But then, especially if the pain is persistent and the dysfunction is persistent, it can spread to other nearby nerves. We call that allodynia. So for some I see patients their bladder pain is so intense that it infects the nerves of their belly. And so you can just, you can't even touch their belly or you can't even touch a pubic hair without them hurting. That's called allodynia. 
So we know that other peripheral nerves can become involved, but we also know that they can calm down. So we know that that sensitive nerve gets to the spinal cord and it's shared around the spinal cord. That's why an irritated a bowel can trigger an irritated bladder. And an irritated bladder can trigger an irritated bowel or an irritated vulva because they share nerves at the spinal cord. So I see subtype five central sensitization, chronic overlapping pain conditions is kind of like that on steroids. Um, it means that the central nervous system has been traumatized. And so here's what we know. A group of patients have IC, IBS, vulvodynia, TMJ, fibromyalgia. We call it the chronic overlapping pain conditions. I'm in that group. I absolutely have history of IC, history of IBS, history of vulvodynia, and very active TMJ right now. Chronic overlapping pain conditions. IC subtype five. And when you're in the middle of it, you're going, what the hell is wrong with me? I have a bladder disease. I have a bowel disease. I have a jaw disease. What the hell? Well, now we know that the common factor is that it's central nervous system driven. It's actually being driven by the brain. Now, this is going to sound scary at first, but it's not scary in the end. There is a very happy ending here. So it was the it was about 15 years ago, the patient organizations of all these related conditions got together and said, we need to fund some research. And they created the Chronic Pain Research Alliance, which is a absolutely fabulous research group. I Google Chronic Pain Research Alliance, going over to their website, it's fabulous. And they started doing brain scans. And again, this again sounds scary, but it's not scary. In the end, it's not scary, happy ending, okay. What their brain scans found was that somebody with chronic overlapping pain conditions, their brain was in a constant state of fight or flight. So what is fight or flight? Fight or flight is the most primitive part of your brain. There is no cognition happening here at all. There's no thinking happening. This is your brain going, oh my God, your life is at stake. I'm gonna prepare you to fight or flee or stand still, fight or flight. So if you were to open up your front door and see a, a saber tooth tiger walking up your driveway, you're immediately going to go into fight or flight. This primitive part of your brain is going to take over. No cognition. It's going to happen like that. You're going to slam the door shut. Your heart rate's going to go up. Your blood pressure is going to go up. Your muscles are going to get tight. Your brain, that primitive part of your brain has one job to save your life. So you are in fight or flight in, in long-term stress. I mean, I'm sorry, that's the word. You are in fight or flight in short-term stress like that. And you guys, I, I will come back to the Ecora, I promise. Okay. Um, normally, though, once the stressor has passed, you go out of fight or flight. The parasympathetic nervous system takes over. It calms all that down. It lowers your heart rate. It lowers your breast pressure. It relaxes your muscles. It turns off the amygdala in your brain, which is driving all the fight or flight. Well, that's not happening in patients with chronic overlapping pain conditions. They're stuck in fight or flight. Their brain is literally stuck there. And it's not a mental illness. There's no cognition here. It is what they call a central nervous system maladaption. The, the nervous system got stuck there. So I attended a conference two years ago, a fascinating conference, and it was all on this. It was about the child with the early trauma. And then as they got older, they developed all these other related conditions, April, just like you. And the uh, one of the ways we absolutely know somebody's in fight or flight is you struggling with massive levels of anxiety, which is a chemical sign that your brain's in fight or flight. So anyway, at this conference, the most important class was a risk factor class. Why does it, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to April? I would like to know. I did not have a normal life because of it. Y'all were getting married, having babies. I was laying in the fetal position in my bathroom with bowel spasms in my 20s. Why? That's crazy. I felt crazy. I felt like I was being punished. Well, here's what the research found for 
of the children that this happened to, there was a physical trauma, a major physical trauma. Being hit by a car. April, lots of mini traumas. You were an athlete. I was an athlete. I broke my tailbone. Absolutely. For a year, I could move it with my finger, which I did all the time, which is weird. Right? So for 80%, of the children that this happened to, there was a major physical trauma. And what we know is that 14 days of pain puts the brain into a constant state of fight or flight. But the other 20% were a victim of bullying or abuse. And that's the example that really makes the most sense. 20 days of bullying will put you into your brain into constant fight or flight. So if you have, for example, um, a, a bully at school, as soon as you wake up in the morning, you, you go, yeah, mental trauma, yeah, you go into fight or flight as soon as you wake up because you know there's somebody that could hurt you. And as the closer you get to school, the more hypervigilant you become. You are in a heightened state of fight or flight. All day, you are in fight or flight waiting for the bully to find you and hurt you. As you walk home, you are still in fight or flight because you're looking behind you for the bully, right? The only break that child gets is when they get home. Three to four hours, they're safe. And then mom says, hey, you got to go to bed. Got to go to school tomorrow. Pulls you right back into fight or flight. So imagine the toll that that takes to the nervous system over time. So as April says here, it was her father who was the bully and that you were about. And, and so you were, so school was your refuge. You were in fight or flight at home. Right. And I'm, I'm, you know, uh, somebody yesterday sent me a, a crazy message about how I wasn't advocating for people who were abused. And it's like, are you kidding me? I work with abuse patients almost every single day on the phone. April, this is not your fault, hon. This was never your fault. There is no shame, no blame. This is, a, you know, you're kind of like that kid who was stuck in a war zone. You know, um, it, Prince Harry and it, Oprah Winfrey did a fabulous, fabulous story uh, a feature last year i would encourage you to watch it if you can find a documentary on on the toll uh that uh of what happens to a child when they're traumatized and how it changes them and it's not what's wrong with you it's what happened to you that matters you were injured and I have shared that I had a rapist murderer in my neighborhood who targeted me, killed my, raped and murdered my neighbor. Okay. And I was in fight or flight every single day from fourth grade through high school. Throw in the random, you know, um, Zodiac victims found not far from my house. Look, we had a lot of there's still a lot of abuse out there. There's still a lot of women who disappear and men who disappear. Scary growing up, especially back in the 70s. So, so our body today and our nervous system today was affected by that trauma. And there, but again, it's not a mental illness. It's called a maladaption. So the, here's the good news is we know how to break you out of fight or flight. We know exactly how to break you out of fight or flight. I'm not in fight or flight anymore. I haven't been in fight or flight since I took an anxiety management class when I was 35. Um, we have got to get your brain out of fight or flight. And the way we do that with mind body medicine. Um, and, the, and we have to give the brain good sensory information. Again, this is about the most primitive part of your brain. You can't think yourself out of this. This is about showing your brain you're safe. And the way you do it is with sensory information. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? What are you touching? You tell your brain you're safe through sensory information. 
And so I spy is a technique that I use that you can Google and I'd be happy to do that privately with you. I don't think we have time to do that now. Um, although if you stick around, maybe towards the end, because we're kind of winding down, people are leaving, we're all getting ready for the Super Bowl, which is going to start in about 30 minutes. Um, so you guys are asking about Eucora. Eucora is too acidic. Um, it's just, I, I have zero success stories for Eucora and bladder pain patients. Not a single one. Now, if somebody knows somebody with diagnosed with IC, chemocystitis, Helner's lesions, who've taken Eucora and it's helped them, please have them call me and let me know. I don't know of any. Uh, the Eucora formulation, I think, is just a bit too aggressive and acidic for us. Uh, let me just let me just look at it real quick. So the ingredients in Eucora in Eucora are, hold on, D mannose, potassium citrate, which alkalinizes the urine. Citric acid, that's a, that's a challenge. It's citric acid and the B6. And even though it has a non-acidic vitamin C in it, the combination of the citric acid, the vitamin C, and the B6, I think is too aggressive for an injured bladder. So, um, and again, it's all about, it's targeting UTI. It's not targeting injury. I remember for a lot of us, our bladder wall, it's the bladder wall's injured. It's not infected. Jerry's saying, is desert harvest good for you? I've had IC for six years. Um, so, uh, Jerry, um, that's a, a difficult, difficult question to ask because it all depends upon what your subtype is, right? So if your IC is being driven by extremely tight pelvic floor muscles, which we see commonly in the great majority of men that I work with, it, it comes right down to pelvic injury. Uh, our therapeutic priority for that patient is going to be to work on those muscles, work on that injury and to restore the blood supply. And there's no supplement that's going to do that. There's no supplement that's going to do that. But if in contrast, you have chemocystitis, you've gone through chemotherapy and the chemotherapy has irritated and damaged your bladder wall, then doing something that is soothing makes sense. And so desert harvest aloe certainly has the potential of soothing those tissues allopath can soothe those tissues. George's aloe drink can soothe those tissues. Um, uh, if we're trying to, for example, if it's if we're dealing with estrogen atrophy and we've got a diminished bladder wall, then we're going to be focusing more on supplements that contain chondroitin rather than aloe. Aloe, the challenge with aloe is some people are just intolerant to it. Worth trying. But uh, also, also, also worth noticing, oh, it's, oh, Jerry says, it's not Jerry, it's Mary. <laughs> that makes a big difference. That makes a big difference. Okay. So, so for, so for Mary, it depends upon your, you know, your presentation. If you have Hunter's lesions and your focus is going to be treating lesions, and I'm not aware of any supplement that would really help that. Uh, no oral, oral medications have been found to be particularly helpful with Hunter's lesions. They need lesion-specific therapy. However, if you have pain from Hunter's lesions, Peora, PEA might be helpful. If you've got bladder wall-driven symptoms from chemotherapy or estrogen atrophy, then we're, we're going to be focusing a little bit more. Well, for estrogen atrophy, you're going to be focusing on chondroitin. From the chemotherapy, it's probably going to be something that might be a little bit more soothing, bladder, bladder builder does both. You could do Peora, you could do aloe, allopath, or desert harvest aloe for those. If it's pelvic floor driven, then uh, why waste your money on supplements? You've got to work, we got to, you got to invest your money in physical therapy to try to fix the muscles, right? If it's pudendal neuralgia, muscles are tight, they're squeezing nerves. Again, supplements are going to be fairly meaningless, except for again, PEA, which might calm some of the nerves down. We're going to be focusing that money on trying to restore good muscle tone. And then for central sensitization, again, it's all about calming nerves down. So the priority really is going to be, again, something that would calm nerves, PEA, most likely, from a supplement standpoint. Sherry says, I'm out of state and can't seem to get my Norco shipped to me. 
Do you know if it can be sent, if sent to me, I called FedEx and they said it's okay as long as it's medical related, but I read it's illegal. Well, if you're asking that if the doctor can refill your prescription out of state, um, uh, you know, they monitor those prescriptions. If you've had too many over a period of time, you appear to be a drug seeker. So it's going to be at the discretion of your doctor, hun. I mean, and if you're asking, can a family member ship you some Norco, your own prescription Norco by mail? I don't know if that's illegal or not. I don't know. You have to look at the postal guidelines here. See, I can tell, I can tell that I haven't drunk enough because I've talked so much. I've now hurt the side of my tongue. Like right there. It's just rubbing against a crumb. I do that every now and then. Ah, life. My goal today is to drink two of these. Just water. I'm really taking my weight gain seriously. I want to get rid of my little tummy. Ann says, can you have both, have both IC and OAB? Well, Um, I would say that the great majority of doctors would consider overactive bladder a, a minor presentation of IC. I mean, overactive bladder means you got frequency urgency. IC means you got frequency urgency pain. So I don't see them as separate and distinct. Lisa, thank you for the 50 stars. Nancy says, I identify, really identify with the central nervous system part. Yeah. April says, I feel that I'm in fight or flight. You've been clenching my teeth a lot, causing daily headaches. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, like, like seriously, seriously, all the stress we've been under the last couple of years with COVID and with all the politics, uh, the dentists are making a killing right now with cracked teeth and TMJ. Crack killing. All right. Mary's saying, what's the best treatment for IC, hun? Okay, but. All right, Mary, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. We've got, you got to understand something here. We don't think of IC as an incurable bladder disease anymore. We don't. We think of IC as a pelvic pain syndrome. Why? Because other structures in the bladder, other structures beyond the bladder are often involved, if not driving these symptoms. So 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, we were all focused on IC as a bladder disease. No, no, I take that back. Maybe 10 years ago. Today, we focus it as a pelvic pain syndrome, and it's very different. Our approach to IC now is very different. So for about the last 10 years, doctors have been trying to define the subsets in the IC patient population because you're not all the same. Again, for some of you, it began in childhood. For others, it began after menopause. For some of you, it began after falling. While for others, it began after drinking too much diet soda or chemotherapy. You can't put apples, oranges, and bananas in the same study and expect them to respond the same or to respond to the same treatment. We put $100 million into IC research. More than that now, probably $200 million. The great majority of it failed. Why? because they put everybody together and we're not the same. So now for the last 10 years or so, the Europeans versus the Americans, everybody's working on trying to define these variants because when we know what your variant is, we can focus the right treatments towards you. Because we would hate for you to stake Elmer on for 20 years only to discover after the fact it wasn't the Elmeron could never have worked for you and that you have a fundamental pelvic floor issue instead. So in Europe, there are 12 variants that they look for and they try to classify you into a variant and then they give you the correct treatment for that variant. In the United States, we don't have a nationally agreed upon system, although most people agree that some patients are bladder centric, but the great majority of patients are beyond the bladder beyond the bladder. There's something beyond the bladder that's driving their symptoms. 
I use a system that was created by a big federally funded IC researcher who ran the IC research program at Stanford University. His name is Christopher Payne. And five years ago, he proposed five subtypes. And I think that they are the bomb. They work so well. So let's go through the subtypes, Mary, and let's see if we can, Mary, figure out what your subtype might be, because that'll help us find the right treatment. Subtype number one, Hunter's lesion. Hunter's lesions. So these are the patients who, when we look in the bladder, bam, this is what we see. Big, bloody wounds. When you biopsy a hunter's lesion, there is profound inflammation. There is a war happening in the bladder in the in this spot, in these spots. And now we know why, one reason why there's a war happening there. It was the researchers in Europe who made a pretty significant discovery that they found viral infection in the urine of patients with Hunter's lesions, a virus called the polyomavirus. And about five years later, our own National Institutes of Health released their study, and they too found virus in five to 10% of IC patients. And we now know COVID can cause COVID-associated cystitis, that COVID can infect the bladder as well. So there's a lot of patients who've gotten COVID who now have IC symptoms because that virus is living in their bladder wall. So now we know why Hunter's lesion patients never responded to Elmeron. So that's one potential cause of a Hunter's lesion, but there are other potential causes of Hunter's lesions. Another very interesting case, Mary, was a woman who had severe, a severe prolapse and severe Hunter's lesions. They published her case study last summer and when they went in to repair the prolapse, what they found was that her uterus had flipped back to front and front to back. One of the anchoring points for her uterus was broken. And so her uterus was swinging, her vagina was swinging. And so when they repaired that and they stabilized her vagina and her uterus, um, her Hunter's lesions went away completely. She's considered a complete cure so that's very interesting. So that helps us understand that if the tissue is twisting in on itself, that's also potentially damaging nerve, creating tremendous neuroinflammation, which could also cause Hunter's lesions. So we've got two clues about Hunter's lesions now. So Hunter's lesions require lesion-specific therapy. They don't respond to Elmeron. They don't respond to a lot of stuff. Um, and you can read about this on the IC Network website, icnetwork.org. Our next subtype is bladder wall driven. So these are the patients whose symptoms began after some sort of legitimate real bladder wall problem. It could be chemocystitis where the chemicals of the chemo damage the bladder. It could be drinking too much diet soda, which damages the bladder or too much coffee. It could be chronic infection, chronic bacterial infection, chronic fungal infection or it could be estrogen atrophy. So our therapeutic priority for this group of patients is to work on the bladder wall. Our third subtype is pelvic floor driven. This is our biggest subtype. These are the patients whose symptoms began after muscle trauma, a car accident, a fall, having a baby, having an injury from a baby, being raped, where the pelvic floor muscles are traumatized, having a broken tailbone where your tailbone's out of position. Um, and, you know, the tragedy here is that for over 100 years, doctors described muscles so tight, they resemble tight piano strings. But urologists play in their sandbox, the urinary tract, they never treated the tight muscles. Now we know to treat the tight muscles. And that pelvic floor physical therapy is remarkably successful at, at curing patients. I'm pelvic floor driven. When my symptoms get weird, it's always because I have tight muscles. And when I do pelvic floor physical therapy, it goes away. I see subtype four, pudendal neuralgia. This, these are patients 
who have muscles so tight they're compromising nerves. So they might have sciatic, a pain shooting down their leg, or they might have a pins and needles sensation somewhere, or areas of numbness somewhere in their crotch, or in their or in their tush. Um, but their classic symptom of pudendal neuralgia is PGAD, feeling this painful arousal sensation at random times. That's a muscle squeezing the pudendal nerve. So our therapeutic priority for this group is to figure out where the nerve is compromised, re re try to remove that, that restriction, and we have to calm the nerves down. And so it's going to be a combination of pelvic floor physical therapy combined with things that will calm nerves down. Uh, from topical anesthetics to gabapentin, stuff like that. And then our last subtype is central sensitization. So these are the patients who have IC, IBS, vulvodynia, TMJ, what I talked about earlier. And for these patients, it's not a bladder disease at all. It's a central nervous system maladaption. And because that brain is stuck in fight or flight, and because that, pain, that patient has massive levels of anxiety, Pain is intensified by the brain because it's trying to save your life. So if you're in pain and you're anxious, your pain absolutely will get worse. Think about, we've all done it. You've all been worried about something. Let's just say you have a spot and you think it's cancer and you're getting ready to go to the doctor and you're, you're absolutely, everything hurts more. You're panicking. You get to the doctor and he goes, oh, it's fine. It's not, it's not a problem. It's a keratosis. We're, you're fine. And you walk out. All of a sudden, your pain goes away. It gets much, much better. That's a sign of a brain that's that not in fight or flight. So when you're in fight or flight, everything gets intensified. And your, your pain levels are going to be higher. So our therapeutic priority for these patients is to calm and soothe the central nervous system. We have to get you out of fight or flight. We've got to get the anxiety under control. And nobody's telling you this is a mental illness. Nobody is saying this is mental illness. This is not mental illness. It is a central nervous system maladaption. Your brain got stuck. It got stuck in fight or flight. And it can get stuck by long periods of pain, by trauma, and or by abuse or bullying. And you can't kid a kidder, man. If you struggle with anxiety disorder, if you got anxiety every single day, you are in this subtype. And every time you have a negative thought, you, you push yourself more into fight or flight. Every time you have a negative thought, you get a jolt of adrenaline. If that chemical mediator is what drives all this. But the problem is, is, is if you have 100 negative thoughts, you got 100 jolts of adrenaline, your brain's on chemical overload. You are stuck in fight or flight. We have got to get you out of fight or flight. We have got to get that anxiety under control. I have a great video on our website about IC and anxiety and the class that I took that completely changed my life. I don't live in fight or flight anymore. I am not struggling with anxiety every day, although it's hard in COVID and caring for elderly patients. I know what to do to keep it, to keep it under control so that I don't allow myself to get into that state of being afraid all the time. So I never let myself, I'm very attentive to negative thoughts. If I have one negative thought, I do a stop sign, deep breath, minimize the thought. If I get two or three in a row, man, I stop what I'm doing. I That's, that's what's going to slide you back in. We got to get those negative thoughts under control. The way we do that is by visualizing a stop sign, taking a nice, slow, deep breath, and reminding yourself it's a thought. It has no power. I say to myself, oh, my God, Jill, you're not God. You can't predict the future. Get a grip. It's a thought. It has absolutely no power. So I have a video that talks about all that. So anyway, anyway, well, listen, I'm kind of talking fast because obviously the Super Bowl is going to start in 15 minutes. They're probably getting ready to do the national anthem right now. Becky says a lot of people in the IC Facebook group that I belong to have good results with you, Cora. I'm, I'm skeptical. I, I, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see the research. I, we, I just cannot in good good consciousness uh, rec suggests that to anybody because it's because of the citric acid alone. It's all about, it's all about their subtype. And that's a flaw with the Facebook IC group it's a, with any support group is you, you've got lots of different types of patients with lots of different anatomies and physiology and they're a one treatment fits all approach simply does not work. It's not fair. So Mary, I hope that that helped a little bit. You're always welcome to give me a phone call. 
the IC network, uh, we have, uh, believe it or not, I do answer the phone. I do answer our patient support line. I uh, usually answer the phone starting after after noon Pacific time. So I'm doing elder care in the morning. Nancy says, I got a Kenalog injection into your pure performance for sciatica. Um, and now my pelvic floor and bladder pain is even worse. Have you heard of this before? Why did they didn't inject it into your SI joint? I've had two cantalog injections into my SI joint, but never into my piriformis. Or were they working on a muscle knot? Was it a trigger point injection to deal with a muscle knot in your piriformis? Tracy, thank you for the 200 stars. Becky says, I'm pregnant. Yeah, yay, congratulations. I know, hon. Uh, you start to flare because it's a very, it's, you, you know, your life is being upended but in a good way. I see patients have babies all the time. All the time. You can be a good mom. We have a pregnancy center on our website you can check out. Shelly says, everything you discuss is so relatable and validating. I try. Nancy said, I had it in the SI first and then went back for the piriformis. Well, when I had, so the last time I had a um, steroid injection, it was into my spine for my ruptured discs. And I had it a year ago. And I will tell you that I had six weeks of low back pain I never had before I had that SI joint. And the way they explained that to me is that it was kind of like the tissue reacting to the steroid and it did go away and I did have benefit after that. But the shot itself, the introduction of the medication itself can trigger more pain. Yeah. So Nancy, so the fact that you're struggling with such intense muscle tension, you know, that's something that and I, I'm going to end this meeting with this because I, I really want to reinforce this point. So, so Dr. Jerome Weiss, the author of this book, was a urologist who saw very early on that bladder therapies didn't work for most of his patients. And so he stepped away from the bladder and started studying the pelvis. And he became basically the musculoskeletal expert at, at in the pelvis for patients with pelvic pain. He he studied the muscles, he studied the fascia, he studied the tendons, he studied the ligaments, he studied the trigger points. And he and his clinic uh, became the master at pelvic floor work. He was literally the first, probably the first MD in the country to actually do this. He had his offices in San Francisco here. But there was one thing that really baffled him. And that is, if you walked into his clinic with tight muscles and trigger points and he treated those and as you walked out, everything was normal tone and the trigger point was gone. Why did it come back a week later or a month later? He was really baffled by that. And so that's when he started looking at bones. Because what puts long term pressure on muscles, but bones, but what he called bony structure abnormalities. Is there a bad hip? Is there a bad SI joint that's tweaking those muscles? Is there a bad tailbone? Is there a bad knee? Or what he ended up finding, the last piece of his puzzle, was that 95% of the patients with long-term chronic uh, pelvic floor tension were not walking correctly. That the way that they were walking was putting chronic tension on their pelvic floor. So look at how you're walking. And I would encourage you to invest in this book it's $29 uh, in the IC Network, $35 on Amazon. Well worth it. Probably the best book ever written, in my opinion, for the pelvic pain patient. Very understandable. All right, last question. Angie, you have to do injections as well as dry needling to get any relief. The injections calm things down so the dry needling therapist can do more. That's right, because the injections are usually some sort of numbing agent that will reduce that pain and discomfort and that reflexive muscle tension. So anyway, all right, guys, it's time for the Super Bowl. I will see you later. I don't know who I'm rooting for. I should root for I should root for the for the Rams since they're in California. But I'm kind of I kind of want the Bengals to win because they haven't won in a long time. So anyway, good luck. Be well. I will see you again next week.
Have a good one. And come on.